Hey there, it's Jason from Codemanship with another video diary entry. Um, today I'm thinking about agile transformations and in particular, why they have a tendency to, to fail, to produce very disappointing results for all the, the time and money um, that's invested in them. All those blood, sweat and tears by consultants and coaches and stakeholders within organisations who are hoping um, for better results. Now I've seen, I, I personally don't engage directly with agile transformations these days, but I've bumped into quite a few over the years. So I've seen many, many sort of outcomes of long-term transformation programs. Um, and they have a bit of a reputation, <laughs> it has to be said. Um, that's not to say that they all fail, of course, but, but they have a tendency to produce very disappointing results. And I wanted to sort of try and capture with a code example, actually, um, why I, I see um, or where I see these agile transformation programs going wrong. It's all about sort of loops, loops within loops, nested loops, if you like. Um, if you sort of visualize agile software development as a set of feedback cycles within feedback cycles, um, and I'm going to illustrate that with some code where I've rigged up a little model that represents a, a sort of agile development process, um, where the outermost feedback loop is releases, uh, working software being released to end users, from which we get that all important feedback. That's really what agile is all about all important feedback that we can learn from and then adapt in the next iteration. So we want those release cycles to be short and we want them to be cheap because they're, they're experiments, essentially. Everything we do in code is an experiment until it hits the real world. So the, the sooner our code can get to the real world, the better. Um, and then within a release, you might have a bunch of features that are scheduled for that release. And for each of those features, you might have a bunch of scenarios. And for each scenario, in order to deliver software that satisfies that scenario, you're probably going to need to build and test that code multiple times. So the innermost feedback is that build and test cycle. Now, here's what goes wrong with agile transformations. For all kinds of reasons, historical, cultural, business, commercial, whatever you want to call them, um, there is a tendency for these transformation programs to focus on optimizing or, or improving these outer feedback loops. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. I think the first reason is that um, non-programming non stakeholders, and let's not say non-technical because they might be technical but not programming, uh, non-programming stakeholders understand these feedback loops. It makes sense to them. They can see why these things would help and they're able to engage. So you can engage most of, the, if not all of the organization in optimizing those outermost feedback loops. So there is a tendency for, for um, businesses to put their money there. Um, or the majority of their money when it comes to trying to improve things. Um, the other reason is, is because of this sort of agile industrial complex that has sprung up over the last 20 years, um, where there are armies of people who call themselves agile coaches and the scrum masters and all these other kind of um, specialists, um, the majority of whom, and I know because I've reviewed a lot of CVs for agile coaches over the years, the majority of them are not programmers. They can help with this stuff, and many of them are very, very good at it, um, but they can't help with this feedback loop. So they tend to stay away from it. So because the availability of agile consultants and coaches tends to lean very heavily towards the non-programming side, but also because the stakeholders within these transformations tend to also lean very heavily towards the non-programming side, that tends to be where all the time and money goes. And maybe they pay lip service to that inner feedback loop of, building and testing our software. Now, what I've rigged up here is, it's just an illustration. This is not a real development process. It's just, you know, a bunch of collections that are, are connected to each other. And I'm looping through these connections, starting with the outermost loop of our release cycles. And in each of these loops, I'm printing out, so we know that we did a release. And I'm also inserting a little pause there, asking the, um, the thread to sleep for 10, milliseconds so every one of these feedback loops has a 10 millisecond performance hit um, okay and if i run this i'm probably going to pause the video while i do this so we've got we've got 10 loops within 10 loops within 10 loops within 10 loops so 10,000 loops basically each of which comes with a 10 millisecond performance hit at least um, so you can imagine this is going to take a few minutes to run so this this simulates slow release cycles with a with a little unit test. so let's run this unit test and we'll get a we'll get a feel for what its output is, and so hopefully we'll start to see some output in a minute. If you'd be so kind, IntelliJ, and my creaking old laptop. Off we go. So you can see that we're we're outputting scenarios and 
features and build and test. And so you can see what's happening as it goes through this. This is going to take a while. So I'm just going to pause the video now and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, we'll rejoin when it's finished. Okay, so it's finished running and it's taken one minute, 54 seconds or thereabouts um, to go through those 10,000 nested loops. Um, so that's kind of my, my programmatic model of slow release cycles. So each of those releases is maybe 20 seconds apart or so. So what could we do to speed those up? Now, this is how the traditional agile transformation goes. It focuses on speeding up the outer loops, the stuff that our non-programming folk can get involved with because that's fun and we get to play with Lego and all sorts of other fun stuff. So we speed out the outer loops. We sped them all up by 10 times. Each of those outer loops is sped up 10 times. Let's run our tests again and see how much of an improvement to overall cycle times that makes. So we're, what we're interested in here is how often we can release. That's the important thing. Okay, off it goes. Gra uh, not Gradle, Maven doing its thing, whatever that is. <laughs> Never quite understood. And I'm going to pause the video again and we'll come back to this when it's finished executing. Okay, and we're back. Did you miss me? So it's finished executing. Remember, we made, we made an optimization, a considerable optimization, a 10 times optimization to the outermost feedback loops. And then we ran our test again to see how long it took to do all those releases. And we managed to shave off about 10 seconds. Now, I appreciate that um, test execution times on the JVM are not deterministic, so this isn't by no means conclusive. But what we can conclude is that the, the overall cycle time is in the same ballpark it was before. We've made a very marginal improvement by, by optimizing those outermost release cycles. So let's, let's put them back the way they were. So with our 10 seconds sleep. And now let's just optimize the innermost feedback cycle, the build and test cycle. So this is, for example, your continuous delivery cycle if you're doing that, which, uh, which you should be. Um, okay, so we're going to optimize the innermost feedback loop and leave the other feedback loops alone. We're not going to touch them. And we're going to run the tests again. And this time I'm not going to pause the video because I am quite confident that we'll make a bigger difference. But let's see, shall we? So Maven again having a little think. And off we go. It's looking a little speedier. But let's see, shall we? Wow, look at that, 25 seconds. So we are quite confidently in a different ballpark here. And what that means is we've gone from doing releases every 10 or 20 seconds to doing them every every two or three seconds. Uh, it's made a big difference to our, our, our release feedback cycle, which is the most important feedback cycle. It's the one where we find out what, what the end users actually think of the software that we've, we've, we've put in front of them. Um, and it's very much the foundation of agility because if you're not able to do that if you're not able to release frequently and reliably and sustainably enough um, then these outer feedback loops they don't really matter it's all guesswork anyway as to what we should put into each release and the sooner we can find out whether our guesses were good guesses or bad guesses um, um, the sooner we can learn from that and adapt and iterate our way towards a design that is a better fit that is better at um, satisfying end users, that better at solving the business problem or whatever we're aiming for. So what I'm saying here really is that the way to optimize outer feedback loops is to optimize the inner feedback loop, the innermost feedback loop. And in terms of software development, that's the, um, the, the feedback loop that we get from building and testing the software, because that's how we know that it's fit for a release. Without that, we don't know that we can release it. Um, so good agile teams are building and testing their code many times an hour. Uh, and that means that their build and test cycles need to be fast. They need to be super fast. And they invest heavily in all the technical aspects that lead you to that. So it's not just about writing unit tests, for example, or build automation. It's also about the architecture of our software, making it more unit testable, making it build faster. So, you know, I work with many clients whose architectures um, um, really make this very, very difficult because of dependencies and all kinds of other problems. Um, so that's the loop that you need to be focusing on, but it is the one that the majority of 
agile consultants don't or can't get involved with. And most people within a development organization are not on that side of things. Um, they're on the other side. And, and, and very typically, the people making the decisions um, about where to focus their resources are people who are not programmers or haven't been programmers for a very long time. And so they will also quite naturally tend to gravitate towards optimizing these out of feedback loops. But as we've seen, you get very, very, very disappointing results when you do that. You get the biggest results, the best results, when you focus on the innermost loop, on the build and test cycle, and on the, the technical cycle, um, side of, of, of software development, on the um, agile engineering practices, if you like, the technical practices. And that's where the majority of your focus and your resources should be targeted, and um, certainly in the early stages of a transformation. Because if you don't, then you're going to get very disappointing results. Um, and that's where agile transformations kind of get their reputation for being disappointing. So there you go, a contentious maybe. If you are an agile coach or a scrum master or someone in that kind of role, just to be clear, I'm not saying that these, these outer loops don't matter. What I'm saying is if this inner loop is slow, then it won't make much difference. All your hard work will not pay off. The results will be very disappointing. So this is kind of this innermost feedback loop of build and test is kind of the foundation of a good agile development process. And you need to be building everything else on top of those strong foundations. So you need to get the technical stuff right. And that is no small order. The amount of guidance and training and help and time and effort that is required to achieve what we call continuous delivery. That's really what this represents, continuous delivery that we're able to build and test continuously. Um, um, that should not be underestimated. It is an order of magnitude larger than is required to solve these problems. But if you don't solve these problems, you will get very, very limited, very disappointing results from everything else you're working on. Um, so go for the innermost loop. This, of course, oh, I've broken the code. Let's unbreak it. Uh, this, of course, and that's why we have tests. Um, this, of course, is just a code example. Um, in the real world, it's more complicated than this, but the principle is still the same. Um, as any programmer, for example, programmers who work on computer games where performance is critical, will tell you, if you're, if you're trying to optimize nested loops like this, you focus on the innermost loop. That will give you the most bang for your buck because that's the one that's executed the most often. If you speed up build and test, the outer feedback loops will start to speed up as well. So you will be able to release more often. And indeed, it is, it is the case, based on data that I've gleaned from a number of clients, that um, teams who have fast build and test cycles, I've broken that code as well, teams who have fast, I'm obsessed with keeping my code working, good Jason, um, teams um, who have fast build and test cycles do tend to release significantly more often. It's an order of magnitude change. Um, so there you go. That's why your agile transformation failed. Hopefully some food for thought, or maybe you do work on performance critical code, uh, and maybe that's a, a, a little useful a tip bit about how to optimize nested loops. Um, but if you think of your development process as nested feedback loops, which is really what they are in agile software development, then the same principle applies. If you want to speed up the outer feedback loop, you need to focus on the innermost feedback loop. Okay. Anyway, I hope you're well. hope you're taking care. Um, if you're enjoying these videos and want to see more, ring the bell for notifications and subscribe to this channel. See you soon.